me past the outer courts into the holy place, past the brazen altar. Lord, I long to see your face, passing by the crowds of people and the priests who sing their praise. Lord, I hunger and thirst for your righteousness, and it's only found in one place. So take me in to the home. Good evening to you. Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Dear friends, I'm very happy to introduce to you Brother Anil Arana and Swapna Abraham will be with us today and coming three days to lead us to come closer to God. The Lenten retreat. On my behalf, on behalf of all the priests in the parish, in the parish community, I'd like to welcome them all heartedly. Welcome to you. And we'll pray that God will Spirit to lead them, to lead us into our Lenten reflections. I am sure today being the working day, the people are getting slowly and hope by the time we start the Lenten reflection, there will be more people attending to it and tomorrow, day after tomorrow, we expect more. So, I'd like to wish them all the best in their ministry and especially for these three days to guide us to reflect the passion and life, death of Jesus Christ and our part in that uh, redemption. And today's Mass being offered for a special intention of E.T. George Cecily. Gladys, Stephen, and family for the special blessings. I'd like to invite you also to pray for Father Tom. Tomorrow makes one year of abdiction by the Muslims in Yemen. And let us pray that the quick release from this captivity. And we also pray for all the souls in purgatory and for the soul of Sojan and Luke and Silveraj, Anthony Vincent, and all the deceased members of their family. To offer the sacrifice word, let us call to mind us and ask God's pardon. You have seen the hill the contrite, Lord have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You plead for the right hand of the Father, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us everlasting life. Let us pray. Pray. 
Show gracious favor, O Lord, we pray, to the works of penance we have begun, that we may have strength to accomplish with sincere sincerity the bodily observance we undertake through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns within the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 1 to 9. Cry aloud, spare not, says the Lord. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and thou seest it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and thou takest no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a man to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a rush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rare God. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. The word of the Lord. Psalm 51. Your response will be, A humbled, contrite heart, O God, you will not spurn. Please repeat. A humbled, contrite heart, O God, you will not spurn. Have mercy on me, God, in your kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offense. Oh, wash me more and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Our response, a humbled, contrite heart, O God, you will not spurn. My offenses, truly I know them. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. What is evil in your eyes have I done? Our response, a humbled, contrite heart, O God, you will not spurn. For in sacrifice, you take no delight. Burnt offering from me you would refuse. My sacrifice, a contrite spirit, a humbled, contrite heart, you will not spurn. Our response, 
a humbled contrite heart O God you will not spurn kindly rise my soul is waiting for the Lord I count on his word because with the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption the Lord be with you a reading the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 9 verses 14 and 15 the disciple of John came to Jesus saying why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We'll go straight with the offertory, because after the Mass, preacher will take over. Brothers, this is a sacrifice we accept to God, the Almighty Father. We offer, O oh Lord, the sacrifice of our Lenten observance, praying that it may make our intentions acceptable to you and add to our power of self restraint through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by your gracious gift each year, you, your faithful, awaits the sacred Paschal feast with the joy of mind and made pure, so that more eagerly intend on our prayer and on the work of charity and participating in the mysteries by which they have been reborn, they may be held to the fullness of grace that you bestow on your sons and daughters. And so with all the angels and archangels, with the thrones and dominions, and with all the powers of heaven, 
we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim holy 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 lord god of power and might heaven and earth full of glory hosanna in the highest blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest you are indeed holy o lord the fount of all holiness make holy day for these gifts we pray by sending on your spirit upon them like a dew fall so that they may become for us the body and the blood of our lord jesus christ at the time he was betrayed and entered willing to his passion he took bread giving you thanks broke it gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice once more, giving you thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, "Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me." the mystery of faith christ has died christ is risen christ will come again therefore as we celebrate the memorable death and resurrection of we offer you lord the bread of life chalice of salvation giving thanks that you held us worthy to be in your presence minister to you humbly we pray that partake in the body and blood of christ we may be gathered in one by the holy spirit Remember Lord your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis our Pope George Anthony Swami Archbishop and all the clergy Remember also brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep the hope of the resurrection and all who died in your mercy welcome them in the light of your face have mercy on us all we pray that with blessed virgin mary mother of god saint joseph of most chaste spouse Saint Teresa of Avila, our patroness, Saint Jude Tadeus, with the blessed apostles, with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son Jesus Christ. Through Him and with Him and in Him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command from divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Grace is gone, peace now days. With the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said, to "Apostles, peace I leave you; my peace I give you." Look not on our sins, but on the faith of the Church, and grace is granted our peace and unity in accordance with their will. Who we'll live and reign forever and ever, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Lamb of God, who take the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who take the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, take the sins of the world. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for you. Lord 
Behold the Lamb of God, behold who take the sins of the world. Blessed are those who call the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you. Don't only say the word, my soul shall be healed.
loves me the blessed lamb of god he loves me the blessed lamb of God Let us pray We pray, Almighty God, that through partaking of this mystery, we may be cleansed of all our misdeeds and so be suited for the remedies of your compassion through Christ our Lord. Through the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, as you know, Anil Arana is famous for leading the people to reflections and meditations and going through our own life. So he's the founder of Holy Spirit Interactive and lives in Dubai. Both of them have come from Dubai all the way to lead us. I'm happy that you're going with us three days. Hope we make best use of this chance to sanctify the Lenten penance and reflections. So I'd like to ask them to take over and towards the end we will have the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. So the adoration and benediction. song because it's an old hymn and most of us know the lyrics see I don't need the book to sing this song so but if we don't know the lyrics you know what the song is you've heard the song before you know what it means those of us who are singing the song my request to you dear brothers and sisters I say this all the time let us always sing to God from our hearts touch your heart touch your heart let us always sing to God from our hearts. Now put your hand down. If the song is not coming from the heart, I will say don't sing. Pray that the song comes from the heart. Take it to the Lord in prayer. This kind of liberation in the presence of God can happen only if we're sincere in what we say, sincere in what we sing. For we are all wretched, miserable sinners. There is not one of us here who is righteous. But the point is that when we come before the God who is all holy, all majestic, 
all great. It doesn't matter because he, all he wants is our sincerity, our honesty. He wants to see us as we are. So we're going to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Come to me, he said, come to me. All those of you who are wearied and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. So some of us have come here after work. I have also come here after work because I worked till last evening and then I took the plane and I came here. So I have also come after work. So many of us have come after work. Some of us have just come to meet the Lord. Whatever our situation, we have come to the right place, to a place of rest, to the seat of mercy, to the river of love, never ending love. And we pray that the Lord helps us open our hearts and be sincere. Be sincere. Come. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Come, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. Let's sing it again. Here we go. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. trouble anywhere is we should never be discouraged come take it to the Lord in prayer take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend can we find a friend so fair Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Yes, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And this is my desire. Let's sing to 
the Holy Spirit and it is the love rising from our hearts. Our love just rising from our hearts. Everything within us cries. Holy Spirit, Lord. Holy Spirit, help us now to give you and life. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, dear Jesus, our Savior, Holy Spirit, our Comforter and Guide, we're so glad to have you in our midst this evening. We thank you, praise you, honor you, worship you, adore you, glorify you. Most precious Lord, our God, we love you. Not only am I lost, you seem lost. You seem lost. But you and I know, dear God, the truth of the matter is that you are and you've always been there. I am the one that ran away. And I come to you. I come to you. In sincerity, in honesty, I'm so grateful to you for bringing me here for these days of retreat. I'm so grateful to you, Lord, for your presence that transforms everything. I am so grateful to you for this rest. Speak your word to our hearts, O Lord. Your word that will not return to you until it fulfills the purpose for which you send it. Speak that word to my heart today. If you say the word, it will be done. Only say the word and I will be healed, O Lord. Spirit of the living God, Move afresh in our hearts and our midst. Speak to us. Speak to us, Lord. Anoint me from the heavens. Anoint me from your holy temple. Anoint me from Zion, oh Lord. Sing it together, anoint me, O God. Anoint me from the heavens. Anoint me from your holy temple. Anoint me from Zion. Let your anointing fall on me. Let your anointing fall on me. And let me be wonderfully special. So dear to thee. And let your anointing fall on me. Let your anointing fall on me and let me be wonderfully special to thee. Let us all rise and let us sing the song again from the top. Anoint me from the heaven. Anoint me from the heaven. Open your hearts to God. Anoint me 
from your holy temple. Open your minds to him. Anoint me from Zion. Open your lives to God. Oh Lord. Sing it one more time. Anoint me. Anoint me from the heaven. From the heaven. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. Let your anointing fall on me. Let your anointing fall on me And let your anointing fall on me Let me be wonderfully special and Let me be wonderfully special So dear So dear To thee, to thee. And let your Father God in heaven, we want to thank you for this beautiful day. We want to thank you for this evening, for gathering us together to hear your word, to stand in your presence, to worship you, to praise you for the mighty God that you are. We want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to return to you again and to be blessed by you immensely. We want to thank you for the word that you are going to speak to us tonight and over the next two evenings, Lord, and for all that you're going to accomplish in us and through us through that word that you speak. We want to thank you for the healing that we're going to receive in soul, in heart, in spirit, in mind, and body. We want to thank you for the freedom you're going to give us from our bondages and from the chains that bind us. We want to thank you for the blessings you're going to shower upon us and all those whom we love. And above all, Lord, we want to thank you for the love that we're going to experience here tonight and over the next two days, a love that is going to change us forevermore. Thank you for this time, Lord, as we say together, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Love you, Father. Love you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you, Spirit. Praise you, Spirit. Praise you, Spirit. Love you, Spirit. Love you, Spirit. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. Good evening. Good evening. Can we put our hands together to God? Praise the Lord. And to some beautiful praise and worship. Thank you, Swapna. Are you happy to be here? Do you believe God is going to do something wonderful in your life tonight? Do you believe He's going to change you completely over the next three days? Do you believe He's going to bless you? Do you believe He's going to heal you? Do you believe He's going to deliver you? And do you believe He's going to anoint you? Then let's put our hands together to our God, thanking Him in advance for everything that He is going to do. This retreat is called the Water of Life Retreat, and it is taken from the Gospel of John. And I'm going to tell you the context of which these words are taken. One day Jesus was going from Jerusalem to Galilee, and on the way he stopped by a well to rest. And when he was sitting by the well, a woman came to draw water from the well. Jesus turned to the woman and said, May I have a drink of water? And the woman was surprised. She turned to Jesus and said, Don't you know you're not allowed to talk to me? You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. Besides the fact, of course, you're a man and I'm a woman. Jesus has a very bad habit of sometimes ignoring our questions. Have you noticed? So he doesn't reply to this woman's question. Instead, he says, If you only knew who was asking you for water, you would ask him for water and he would give you living water. 
The woman laughed, said, you don't even have a bucket to draw water with. What water are you going to give me? Again, Jesus ignored her question and he said to her, Truly I tell you, the water you drink will only leave you thirsty again, but the water I give you will become in you a spring leading to eternal life. This is the water that Jesus wants to give all of us. Eternal life. One day in another context, he said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that you might have life and life in abundance. Do you like scripture? Good, I'm going to quote a lot of scripture, but more than that, I'm going to teach you a lot of scripture. And we're going to begin with this one. Say John 10.10. 10. The, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy but I I come that you might have life and life in abundance your turn go on say it John 10 10 the thief bravo now I have to ask you a question, and I'm going to keep asking you questions over the next three days. And the first question I am going to ask you, where? Where is the abundant life? Where is evidence of the abundant life that Jesus came to give us? When I look around me and I look at Christians in particular, all I see are people who are anxious, people who are worried, people who are afraid, people who live in this world apologizing for their existence. So where is the abundant life? Where is the joy that Jesus said we will have? Where is the peace that he said I have come to give you? Where is freedom? Where is life? I don't see it. I really don't see it. The Christian is the child of God and he should be living in power. Where is the power? I don't see it. That is the bad news. The good news is in three days, we are going to start to live this abundant life. Say amen. amen. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you another story, but before I get to that story, I need you to do something for me, okay? Are you ready? I need all of you to stand up. Before that, I need my water. I need all of you to stand up. I need you to raise your hands in the air like this. And I need you to sing after me, all right? Hallelujah. 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 Somebody asked me why I made you do that. Nobody wants to know? Thank you for asking me, my brother. Nobody else cares, but I will give you the answer. Thank you. Three reasons. Reason number one, God is in the hallelujah. So when we say hallelujah, God comes and dwells in our midst because as scripture says, God dwells in the midst of our praises. You want God here? I want God here. So that is reason number one why we say hallelujah. Reason number two. Whenever the word of God is proclaimed, whenever someone comes and talks to you about God, whenever someone comes and preaches the word of God, whether it is at mass, whether it is on television, whether it is here on a retreat, miracles take place. Because the word of God says his word cannot leave him empty. It will return to him and fulfill the purpose for which he sent it. And you will see miracles. And when we say hallelujah, we acknowledge that it is God performing the miracles and not the priest or the preacher standing in front of you. Right? And reason number three is really very important. 
It is to make sure that none of you fall asleep because it is very hard to fall asleep standing up with your hands in the air saying hallelujah, right? And the one thing I am going to make sure is that none of you fall asleep. I know you're tired. I don't care. Now the devil's job is to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to do that tonight. Let him do his job. I will do my job. And my job is to make sure that you have the abundant life that Jesus Christ came to give you. Amen? Amen. All right. Good. Put your hands together. Come on. Let's see that. <clears throat> Those of you at the back would like to come forward, you're most welcome to do so. Here's where the old anointing is. And I get to see your faces too, so it's more fun that way. Now I'm going to take you to the Word of God. And I'm going to read you a story. Now, I know that many of you find the Bible very boring. I'm going to show you that it is not boring. In fact, it is the most interesting book you will ever read in your life. The reason we find it boring is because very often we think of it as something that happened 2,000 years ago. And it is very dry and it is very tasteless. But you will discover now in the next 15 minutes how vibrant the Word of God is, how powerful it is, and how dramatic it is. Are you ready? <clears throat> now, before I start to read it to you, I want you to do something, okay? I want you to put yourself in the story. Now, in this story, Peter is being called by Jesus to follow him. It is the first calling. And I want you to be here, and I want you to... Pay attention to every word I say because I'm going to ask you a question after I finish and I'm guaranteeing you that you will get the answer wrong. Okay? Now for this story, I also need you to be somebody that you're not. I want you to be Peter. Who are you? Peter. Very good. Who are you? Who are you? Everybody's Peter? Listen. Luke chapter 5. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him, listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Peter, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Peter answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and have caught nothing. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full the boats began to sink. When Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Then Jesus said to Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Who are you? What is your occupation? Very good. What are you doing in this story? Wrong! I told you I was going to get you. You're not fishing in this story. You have spent the entire night fishing and you have caught nothing. In this story, you are cleaning your nets. Told you I was going to get you. What is your mood? Sad, what else? Disappointed, what else? Talk to me. Rejected, dejected, what else? Frustrated, what else? Depressed, worried, you think you're going to go home to your wife and your wife is going to say, how many fish did you catch, darling? And you're going to say nothing. And what's your wife going to say to you? 
And all these emotions are going through your mind and you're washing your nets. <sighs> While just a few feet away from you is Jesus. Talking to thousands of people who are hanging on to every word that he's saying. There are words that they've never heard before. Words of life, words of love, words of power, words of hope. Everyone is listening to him enthralled. But you? <clears throat> Jesus looks at you. And he knows he has to get your attention because he has a plan for you. So he comes to you. He stops talking. He comes to you and says, Peter, I need to get into your boat. Now you're angry, right? And if someone comes and says he wants to use your boat, you're likely to tell him to get lost. But you've also kind of hurt this man. And you say, okay, let me be a polite gentleman and let him use my boat. So you tell Jesus, get into my boat. And you get into the boat with Jesus. And now you are locked in with Jesus. You might want to jump out. You might want to run away. But there is a chance you're not going to do that. Just like you are locked in with me. Aren't you? You might want to get up from those chairs and you might want to leave. But I don't think any of you is going to do that any more than Peter could leave the boat. And then Jesus starts to talk again. And as Peter hears Jesus talk, something starts to happen to his heart. Something starts to happen in his mind. Something even starts to happen in his body. And Peter doesn't know who this person is who's standing in front of him. But he knows this is somebody not quite human. And then Jesus finishes talking and he says to Peter, he says to you, let's go fishing again. Who are you? What is your occupation? What is Jesus' occupation? Carpenter, thank you very much. Now, if a carpenter were to tell you, a fisherman, to go fishing again, when you have spent the entire night fishing and have not caught anything, what are you going to tell the carpenter? Hey, mind your own business, Charlie. You know, you go fix your tables and chairs and let me mind my business. But as I told you, Peter understands that he is in the presence of somebody extraordinary. So he says to Peter, so he says to Jesus, because you say so, I'm going to go fishing again. And when he goes fishing again and he throws out his nets, he catches so many fish that the boats begin to sink. And then Peter has what I call a Jesus experience. And the experience is this. When a human being comes face to face with the divine, the human being knows that if the divine so much as touches him, he will burn to a cinder. So Peter drops to his knees and says, Stay away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And then Jesus says to Peter, as he says to all of us, Don't be afraid. I have not come to condemn you, but to save you. For whoever believes in me will not perish but have eternal life. And then he says to Peter, as he says to you, get up, come follow me. And Peter immediately gets up and follows Jesus, leaving behind even his miracle fish. Did you like this story? The Bible is filled with stories like this and you're going to hear so many of them and as you listen to the Word of God I am telling you something is going to happen in your heart something's going to change in your mind that life that you've been leave, leading all these years a life of worry a life of misery a life of sorrow a life of impotency a life of helplessness is going to change because every one of you is truly going to breathe and live the abundant life that Christ has come.
to give you. Now, who are you? Very good. By the time you leave you, all of you will start saying, I'm Peter. If someone asks you what's your name, don't tell them Peter though, okay? You're Peter? Who am I? No, no, I'm not Peter. Thank you. I'm not Jesus, but pretend I'm Jesus for now, okay? And just like that Jesus told that Peter 2,000 years ago to follow him, this Jesus is telling you here, sitting in Nungambakam, to come and follow him. How many of you are willing to follow Jesus right now, right here? Raise your hands. Oh, everybody, praise the Lord. I can go home. I don't need to preach anymore. I'm going to tell you another story and then I'm going to ask you this question again. And then I want to see how many of those hands remain up. Are you ready? Once a rich young man went to Jesus. He had a lot of money. And he went to Jesus and said, Jesus, what is the secret of eternal life? And Jesus told him, you know the commandments, honor your father and mother, do not steal, do not kill. And the rich young man said very self-righteously, all this I do. Then he should have shut up and gone away, but instead he opens his mouth and puts his foot right in. He says, tell me what else I need to do. And Jesus says, if you really want to follow me, go, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And you know what this man did? Zoop! Say zoop. He ran so fast, he, the carpet caught fire. Now Jesus is asking you again. Come follow me. How many of you still want to follow Jesus? Raise your hands. Praise the Lord. Swapna, can we get the collection baskets here please? <laughs> They're all going to sell everything they have and give it to the poor. I would like to believe you. <clears throat> Father Stanley would like to believe you. Jesus would like to believe you, but I think we all know that it is kind of difficult to follow Jesus. Give everything up. How many of you have a phone? All of you have a phone? Some of you have two phones, no? If I were to ask you to just switch off those phones for three days, that's all. <laughs> just three days. How many of you will be able to do that? Don't, don't, don't. All simply, all rubbish. <laughs> Y'all can't live without Wi-Fi anymore. Y'all can't live without half the things of this world anymore. Forget about giving up everything and following Jesus. But I want to tell you something. I want to tell all of you something. That before this retreat gets over, you will truly be so filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit that you truly would be willing to leave everything and follow Jesus. Now, I have another question. I told you I'm going to keep asking you questions. This is a very different retreat, okay? You need to kind of participate. You need to, to engage with me. Because I want you to to understand that you're not here by accident and you're not here just to listen to another preacher you are here on invitation by Jesus himself he wants to change you yes but he wants to change that world and the reason he has brought you here is because he believes that you are the people who are going to make a difference to this world now, how many of you like this world? Raise your hands. The evil and the crime and the hatred and the hurting and the abuse. You like that world? If you like it, you're welcome to return to it. I mean, you can go back right now to that world of pain. Or you can believe that Jesus says, you have the power to make a difference to that world. And I'm telling you, I am promising you this. By day after tomorrow evening, Jesus is going to light a fire in you that is so bright, that is so fierce. Not only is this fire going to light you up, it's going to light your family up, and it's going to light all of Chennai up. And we are going to bring about a difference, and we are going to bring about a change. But first the question, why do you think 
Peter was able to leave everything immediately and follow Jesus and not the rich young man. Go on. He realized the sinfulness. Very good. That's one. Another reason. He had the God experience. Very good. I'm going to give you three reasons and I want you to listen to me very carefully. Reason number one. Everybody thinks that Peter had a lot to lose. Had nothing to lose. And they think the rich young man had a lot to lose. But this is not true. Because if you look at Peter, he had two boats full of fish. And if Peter was worldly, he could have thought, I'm going to go into business. I'm going to call my business Peter Fisheries. I'm going to sell dried fish, pickled fish, curried fish, and I'm going to become the fish king of Jerusalem. Peter had a lot. Why, however, was he able to leave everything and not the rich young man? I'm going to give you the answer and pay attention. Peter understood that it was better to be with the blesser than with the blessings because when you are with the blesser, you get all the blessings you need. Now some of you might be very rich here. Some of you might be very blessed over here. Who gave you all these blessings? It was Jesus. But very often we forget about the person who gave us the blessings and concentrate on the blessings themselves. And that is the problem with this rich young man. He saw all the money he had. And he thought, wow, I am so blessed. But then he grew attached to the blessings. And this is the problem. When you get attached to the blessings, you forget the blesser. But listen to me now, when you stay with the blesser, you will get all the blessings that you need in your life forevermore. In fact, for eternity. That's reason number one. Reason number two, like one of our sisters said, Peter understood that he was a sinful man in need of salvation. The rich young man, he was doing everything. Oh, I keep the commandments. I go to church every day, I go to, um, I go to prayer meetings, I give to charity, I do all that is needed to do. And he thought he was following Jesus, he knew, he thought he knew God, but he didn't understand, like Peter did, that he was a sinful man who needed God's salvation. And we are never, ever going to change unless we understand what Peter understood. And I'm going to say something that it hurts me to say. And I hope you will forgive me for saying it. Many of us sitting here don't really understand. We don't really know who Jesus is. And we don't really know what he did for us. Because if we knew who he was. And we knew what he did for us. This world would already have changed. Why do I say that? I say that because we don't realize we're saved. We go to church and we do all the right things, but we don't realize we've been saved. I'm going to tell you my story. I know some of you are here and I've heard this before, but I promise you that during the course of the next two days, you will hear many things that are new. But a few things you will hear are things that you've heard before and one of them is my testimony. Do you mind if I share it? No? Today I travel around the world and I preach the Word of God. I go from country to country, from city to city, from parish to parish, from prayer group to prayer group and hundreds of thousands of people around the world have heard the Word of God from me. But ironically, for most of my life I didn't believe in God, 25 years to be exact. I was about 13 or 14 years old when I stopped believing in God. The reasons are many, they're not important to anything I have to say today. What is important is that my disbelief in God was complete. I just did not believe that God existed. And as the years went by, nothing changed that belief. I used to read a lot and all the philosophers and the wise men I read just seemed to confirm my own belief that God was somebody we invented to explain the things we couldn't explain. But if intellectual certainty was not enough, 
My own life seemed to bear witness to the fact that God wasn't real. If you had met me about 15 years ago, you would have met a man who had everything a man could want. I had a very successful business with offices in three countries. I had a wife and two children. I had a big house with every luxury you can imagine. I had three cars. Don't ask me what I needed three cars for. I still don't know. But more than this, I was a man to whom nothing bad ever seemed to happen. I used to get into fights. I used to get into accidents. I used to get into situations that should have seen me arrested or injured or even dead. But nothing happened to me, not even a scratch. And when you live a life that is so charmed, you begin to think you're invincible. You begin to think you're untouchable. You begin to think you can do anything you want. And for a long time I could. Until one day things started to change. I lost my business. It's a long story. I don't need to go into that. Then I lost all my money. Then I lost all my friends. It's usually what happens when you lose all your money, right? And bit by bit I began to lose everything until one day all I had left was my freedom and my family. And then there came a day when I lost that too. I went out drinking one night. I got so drunk, I don't remember getting home. I don't remember what I did after I got home, except sometime in the morning, I found my room filled with policemen, and I knew I had done something terrible. I was taken to the lockup, and a little later, I found out what I had done. I had smashed my house to pieces. I had hurt my wife so badly she had to be taken to hospital, and I pulled a knife on her threatening to kill her and my little daughter, who was then only about six years old. Now I was a bad man, and I wasn't a very good husband or a very good father, but in my strange way, I loved my family, and it seemed impossible to me that I would do something like this to hurt them. But in one of those rare moments of honesty that we're sometimes blessed with, I realized that in anger, especially drunken anger, I could have killed them all. And I was horrified and ashamed. And I went to my wife and I told her how sorry I was. I said, I'll never do anything like this again. But she said, Anil, I'm tired of listening to your lies and taking your abuse. I'm taking the children and leaving. And in that moment, I knew my life was over. In less than 12 months, I had lost every single thing that I had. And when you don't have anything then what is the point of life so I decided then that I was going to kill myself I decided then one day I'll go for a swim and keep on swimming it was all over for me and I sat down in the jail cell wondering what happened to this invincible man what happened to this untouchable man what happened to this man who could do anything he wanted he's lying in jail cell like a common thief and as these thoughts went across my mind, I happened to look in the cell across from me and I saw a young man sitting there reading the Bible. But what I noticed about him was the look of peace he had on his face. He looked so peaceful, he looked like an angel. And I envied him. And I envied him more a minute later when I realized in all my life, 25 years of it, I had not known one day of peace. Not one day. So I went to this young man and I asked him, how do you manage it in jail? And he simply looked at me and he smiled and said, Jesus. Now, I didn't believe in Jesus any more than a day earlier. But hope springs eternal in the human heart. And when you have decided you're going to die, you just cling to whatever straw you can. And I remember crying out to Jesus in the cell that day. I said, Jesus, if you truly, if you really exist, help me get out of this mess. And I almost imagined I heard somebody sigh. The next time I spoke to my wife, I told her not to leave me. I said, I'll do anything to keep the family together. I'll even get back to God. And I don't think she believed me. And she reasoned not to because when I said I didn't believe in God, I didn't believe in God. I was so sure that he didn't exist. I didn't let our two children be baptized. I didn't let my wife pray in the house or outside the house. If she dared to bring a Bible or a prayer book into the house, I'd tear it up and throw it into the garbage. And here I was telling her I was willing to get back to, her, get back to God. I don't think she believed me. But my wife is a good woman and she seemed prepared to give me a chance. And I was grateful because I did mean what I said. 
And the first day they let me out of jail, I walked into a church for the first time in 25 years of my own will. Mass was going on. I took part in Mass the best I could, which wasn't much really. I stood when everybody stood. I sat when everybody sat. But I couldn't bring myself to kneel. I was so proud, so arrogant. After Mass was over, I went to meet the parish priest. His name was Father John. And I told him I want to get back to God. He looked at me for a long minute. And then he said, I don't believe you. Go back to church and meditate for a while. And I thought, what a, never mind what I thought. There seemed to be some truth in what he said. Besides, I was too tired to argue. So I went back to church and I sat down there wondering what to do next. I wanted to believe in God. I needed to believe in God. But what was I supposed to do? Say, hey God, sorry, I made a mistake about you. You're real. I wanted to do that, but it wasn't happening. Not here. And as I sat down in the church, looking around very helplessly, not knowing what to do, what I was supposed to do, my eyes fell on a beautiful picture of Our Lady holding the baby Jesus. It was a black and gold mosaic, and she really looked lovely in it. And as I looked at her, I suddenly heard her say to me, Anil, come to me. I looked away. I thought my imagination was running wild. But then a moment later, I heard her say again, I can still hear a voice in my mind, so tender, so soft, so gentle, Anil, come to me. But rather than be happy, I started to get frightened. You know, when you hear voices in your head, pictures talking to you, it's not a good sign. It's a sign a few screws are coming loose there, right? And I began to get frightened. And then I heard her say for the third time, Anil, don't be afraid, come to me. Fortunately, there were only five people in the church that day. Otherwise, I never would have done what I did next. I got up and I walked across to this picture. And as I stood there, I felt something reach out and touch me. And this fire traveled through my body. Only it wasn't a hot fire. It was a cold fire. And the most beautiful thing I have ever experienced. And then I believed. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. It is said. All you need to do is take one step towards God and He will cross miles to get to you. And I saw evidence of that in the church that day. I was a man who was lost and couldn't find his way back home. God didn't wait for me to stop and ask for directions. He came and He took me home. And on the way He gave me a gift. Do you know what He gave me? He gave me the gift of faith. Do you know what faith is? I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and the mountain will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Matthew 17, 20. One more verse. John 14, 12. Jesus says to his apostles, I tell you the truth, if anyone has faith in me, he will do what I am doing. Indeed, he will do greater things than these because I am going to the Father. We all know what Jesus did, right? What did Jesus do? He made the blind see, he made the deaf hear, he made the lame walk. He multiplied fish and loaves. He walked on water. He brought the dead back to life. Now listen to me one more time and listen carefully. Jesus is talking to his apostles and he's saying, if anyone has faith in me, he will do what I'm doing. She will do what I'm doing. Now, church, I have to ask you, I have to ask you, do you have faith in Jesus? Yes. Are you doing the things that Jesus has been doing? Are you making the blind see? Are you making the deaf hear? Are you making the lay walk? Are you working miracles? Are you bringing the dead back to life? And if you're not doing it, you have to ask the question, why are you not doing it? You have to. There can be two possible answers. One, Jesus is a liar. Two, maybe we don't have the kind of faith we need to have. Let's take the first one first. Is Jesus a liar? Are you sure? Which leaves us only with number two. Maybe 
We don't have the kind of faith we are required to have because Jesus himself is saying to us, if anyone, he's talking to the apostles, but he's not saying only you guys. He's saying, if anyone has faith in me, he will make the blind see. She will make the deaf hear. He will make the lame walk. She will multiply fish and loaves. He will walk on water. They will bring the dead back to life. I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to come back to all of this. And I'm going to tell you. I'm going to show you how you can start working miracles. Can I get back to my testimony? Are you bored? Are you sure? On television, back there at home, sitting down, are you bored? Good. I, good, I'm glad. I went back to the priest, and this time, fortunately, there were no questions about my sincerity. Very graciously, the priest took me under his wing, and he taught me things I learned as a little child. I was born a Catholic, and I almost think, uh, I think I would have become a priest. By the time I was 12 years old, I used to hang around priests, I used to make rosaries for them, I used to be an altar server, I used to read the Word of God, I did correspondence courses in scripture study at 12 and 13, mind you. And then the devil stole me away, but never mind all that. The priest started teaching me all these things, and I was surprised at how much I remembered. And after a week, he said, Anil, you're ready to make your confession. And I wanted this to be a good confession. So the night before, I sat down and I went through my life. And I discovered I had committed just about every sin known to man. And again, I was ashamed and horrified. Not so much by the number of sins or even the extent of sinning, but by the fact I had not even been aware that so much of what I was doing was wrong. The next day, I went to the priest and I made my confession. I was with him for two hours. I spent one hour just weeping. I have never cried so much in my life. And after I finished my confession, he said, Anil, for your penance, I want you to say one rosary. And I went, what? One rosary? That's it? 25 years of sinning, I get away with one rosary? And he said, why? What do you want to do? And I said, I don't know, Father. At least make it 25 rosaries. No, one for each year I've been away. And he said, you want to say 25 rosaries, be my guest. But for me, that wasn't enough. In the world I came from, if somebody hit me in one eye, I hit him in both the eyes. I wanted to be punished for my sins. I wanted to be taken out and beaten to a pulp. And this priest, despite whatever I might have thought of him in the beginning, was a very wise man. He seemed to know what I was thinking because... The words that he said next would change my life forever. He said, Anil, this is penance, not punishment. You don't have to pay the price for your sins because Jesus Christ of Nazareth paid the price for you. You are free to go. And it is at that moment my life changed forever. Now, my brothers and my sisters, I'm going to ask you a very stupid question. And forgive me for asking you this stupid question. Do you really know Jesus died for your sins? I know you're afraid to answer me. Answer in your hearts. Do you really understand what he did? So that you might live this abundant life. I know you're here. Because you love Jesus, because you are Christian, because you want to hear the word of God. I know you're here because you seek blessings from him and he's going to bless you. I know you are here for many, many reasons, especially because you like Jesus. But I want to really know, and I want you to really know, do you understand what he did for you? I was in Australia last year. I preached a retreat for three days. And after I finished preaching the retreat, I met this lady. This lady came to me and said, Brother, I envy you, your relationship with Jesus. And I said, why do you envy me, this relationship? Don't you have it? And she said, no, brother. I pray the rosary every day. I go for mass regularly. I spend hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament. But I don't have the relationship that you have. It didn't make sense to me. Then what are you doing all these things for if you don't have a relationship? So I asked her, why do you think you don't have this relationship? And she said, brother, because I've not had the kind of encounter that you've had. 
And this worried me and this troubled me. So I went home that night and I sat down with Jesus and I said, how do I bring people to an encounter with you? And then he said, Anil, tell me about the encounter you had with me. When did it happen? So I thought about it and I said, did it happen when your mother touched me in that church? And he said, no, think again. And I thought about it a little more and I knew what Jesus was trying to tell me. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to bring you to an encounter with Jesus. Are you ready? Before that, I need you all to stand up, put your hands in the air and do the God salute with me. Open your hearts. Open your hearts to God. Open your minds to God for the truth that he's going to reveal about his love for all of us. Hallelujah. 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 Say Jesus Lord. Jesus Lord. I have known you forever. I have known you forever. But I don't think I may have met you. But I don't think I may have met you. I'd like to meet you here tonight. I would like to meet you here tonight. I would like to change. I would like to change. As a result of that meeting. As a result of that meeting. And I would like to change the world around me. And I would like to change the world around me. My heart is open. My heart is open. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me, Lord. Help me to understand. Help me to understand. And having understood. And having understood. Help me to obey. Help me to obey. Put your hands down. We're going to sing Welcome Holy Spirit. It's an easy song that I think most of us know. We just like to let the spirit move in our midst as we sing this now. I truly believe that this experience that we have is going to transform us forever. And even as we are transformed, we're going to transform this entire city that we live in. And also that we transform this country that we belong to, if not the entire world. God has called us here for a very special purpose, for a reason that has to do beyond ourselves. And let us just tell him that we are ready as we sing this song, welcoming the Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your power. Live inside of us. Live inside of us. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence, Lord. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your power. Live inside of us. Live inside of us. You are the living water. You're the living water. Never drying fountain. The never drying fountain. Comfort and counselor. My comforter and counselor. Take complete control. You're the living water. You're the living water. Never drying fountain. The never drying fountain. Comfort and counselor. The comforter and counselor. Take complete control. Take complete control. Welcome, Holy Spirit. I am in your presence. I am in your presence. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your power. Live inside of me. Live inside of me. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your power. 
Move inside of me. Move inside of me. Fill me with your power, Lord. Fill me with your power. Breathe inside of me. Breathe inside of me. Live inside of me. Move inside of me. I'm going to ask for a volunteer here and come. Yeah, you, come. What's your name? Nikita? Um, we're going to go to the center. Can all of you see Nikita? Can all of you hear me? Clear? At the back? <clears throat> all right. Um, are you a good person, Nikita? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. Are you good people? <clears throat> Don't be afraid. Say yes, no. Kind of. Okay. All right. <clears throat> do you ever lie? Yeah. You do? Yeah. You're very honest for a liar. <laughs> do you ever lie? See, you don't have to worry. You're in good company. <laughs> do you ever gossip? Yeah, I do. You do? Do you ever gossip? <laughs> We're all doing these things. And the little things. But we smile as we say them. Have you noticed? What are we actually doing here? We are sinning. And the wages of sin is, say it loudly, the wages of sin is, and for her sins, for your sins, small though they might be, the punishment is death. And we smile. And for her sins, because the wages of sin is death, she's going to be stoned. She's going to be stoned right now, and you sitting here have stones in your hands, and you're going to kill her. Now, why are the wages of sin death? Before we, we, we stone her, I want us to understand that. Why are the wages of sin death? So, Nikita, can I ask you to just sit down? Brief reprieve, then we'll stone you, okay? <clears throat> have you heard of happy, clappy people? The charismatics are generally called happy, clappy people because they always have the smile on their faces and they're always clapping, right? Now, there was a guy I knew who was a happy, slappy guy. He had this habit of slapping everybody that he met. Do you know people like that? You do, right? One day he gets into a taxi and he slaps the cabbie. What do you think happens to him? He gets slapped back and he gets thrown out of the cab, right? Now you think he's learned a lesson or two. Happy Clappy has not learned any lesson. He walks down the road. He could have been traveling in comfort in the taxi. Now he has to walk. He sees a group of men on the street corner. He goes to the leader of the group and slaps him on the face. Now what happens to him? He gets slapped. All of them slap him, right? By the time they're finished with him, happy slappy can't see with one eye. You think he's learned a lesson now? Happy slappy doesn't learn at all. He sees a policeman a little further ahead. He goes to the policeman, slaps him on the face. Now what happens to him? Very good. He gets thrown into jail and every cop in the station piles on him. By the time they let him out, forget about one eye, happy slappy can't see with both eyes now. You think he's learned a lesson now? He goes to the ruler of his country and slaps him on the face. Now I don't know what they do in India, but in my place where I come from, you slap the ruler and... That's it. That's the end of it. Now there is an important lesson to be learned here. And the lesson is this. The level of punishment you undergo is directly proportional to the importance of the person you offend. Let me simplify that. The more important the person you offend, the greater the punishment. Do you agree? Now imagine if you slap God. 
And when we sin, we kind of do the equivalent of slapping him, which is why the wages of sin is death, and which is why dear Nikita over here, even though her sins are not very huge, deserves to die. And now she is going to die right here in your midst. You are going to throw stones at her and kill her. And Nikita looks at you and knows without a shred of doubt that there is nothing that is going to stop her from dying a terrible, horrible death. And then I come and say, stop, stop. Everybody stop. Don't kill her. Kill me instead. Nikita, you are free to go. What do you think she feels now? What do you think is going on in her heart as she makes her way from here to her chair or to her home? What do you think happens to her as she sits down? She's shaking like a leaf, unable to believe what just happened. There she was a few moments ago, facing certain death, and now she's alive. How? And then she looks at me and wonders, who is this guy who took my place? And why did he take my place? And then she watches. Every hand go up. Every stone arc itself into the air and comes landing on me. Breaking skin, crushing bone, making blood spurt. What do you think she does? She whimpers and she moans and she cries. And then she watches me go to my death. And what do you think happens to her? She goes home that night. You think she can sleep? Every time she closes her eyes, all she can see are stones flying and my body breaking and blood spurting. You think she's able to do any work the following day? You think she's able to sleep the following night? You think she's able to function at all? She cannot. How can she? And then suddenly, three days later, I come back. And I go to Nikita. And Nikita says, you, you're alive? How is that possible? I saw you die right before my eyes. And then she asks, why did you do that? Why did you take my place? I'm the one who deserved to die. And I tell her, Nikita, because... I love you and because you have a father in heaven who loves you and the only way to get you back to heaven was if I came and died for you so that you might live and live forever. And what do you think happens to Nikita after that? She's going to continue to lie. She's going to continue to gossip. She's going to continue to sin. All she's going to do after that is get to know this wonderful person who died for her. Now you know who we're talking about here, don't we? We're not talking about me. I mean, I would like to think I would die for you, but I know somebody who really did die for us. Who's he? Say it loudly. What's his name? And if you understood what I just told you, you cannot be the same again. How can you be the same again? How many retreats are you going to go for? How many times are you going to listen to the word of God? Before sin starts to become something that is obnoxious to you. How often is the devil going to come and steal and kill and destroy you and your loved ones before you finally understand that he is an enemy? We make human enemies and we don't talk to them for years. The devil is an enemy who has taken everything we have. He has crushed it. He has spoiled it. He's taken life and turned it into death. He's taken joy and turned it into sorrow. And we make him our friend. Ask yourself if this isn't true. He is an enemy.
understand what kind of an enemy he is until we understand what he did to our Lord and what our Lord did for us. And that is the encounter. That is the encounter we need to have so that our lives change. So that we get to know this wonderful God who loves us so much. And we spend every moment of our lives trying to get to know him more and more. A person who loves us so much, he died for us? My God, I wanted to know that man. And for the last 15 years, every day has been spent getting to know him better and better. And not only that, every day has been spent in getting my brothers and sisters to a knowledge of him and his love. If you are saved, if you really are saved, these are two things that you will do. Get to know him better and make sure that the world doesn't perish outside for a lack of knowledge of Christ. Why do I do this? Why does Swapna do this? She has a job. She works for eight hours, nine hours. And then whatever time she has left over, she uses it for God. I look at my brother Jeevan here. He's a businessman. He has to look after his family. But he arranges retreats like this constantly because he also understands what I understood. And that man is not even born a Christian. He's come from another faith. He discovered Jesus. He discovered how much Jesus loved him. And ever since that day, ask him if this isn't true. I don't even need to know his story because I know. He's had the experience I just described. And by God, you've had that experience here today. And God wants you to know. He wants you to know. The reason for this is because He wants you to have life and life in abundance. My heart gets sick when I see Christians struggling. My heart starts to hurt when I see the pain that Christians are in. I start to, to feel traumatized by the grief and sorrow my brothers and sisters go through every day of their lives. Worry, fear, anxiety. Dread, addictions, bondages, my God, that is for them. Pagans out there who don't know Christ, not for us. And this Lent, I want everything to change. This Lent, God wants everything to change. And when you leave from here, my brothers and my sisters, I don't want you to leave the people you were when you walked in here. How many retreats? How much are you going to listen to God's word? You got to get to know God. He's so wonderful. He is so amazing. He is so beautiful. He is, he is beyond comprehension. And that is what I want us to really understand. You are beautiful beyond description. Just listen to this song. Don't do anything. Just sit down and let God work. Because He is in our midst and He is going to do what He wants to do. Just listen to this song. Close your eyes. But open the eyes of your heart. And with the eyes of your heart, see Jesus who stands before you today. Look at Him and His beautiful face and, and those eyes that are so filled with love, so deep. You will never be able to fathom how deep that love is until you're close to Him. And today with those eyes of love, as you look at Him, I want those hands to move and just reach out and touch His beautiful face. He is here with us now. Be with him. You are beautiful beyond description. To marvelous for words. To wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen. Your infinite wisdom Who can fathom The depth of your love You are beautiful Beyond description Majesty Enthroned above And I stand
to bear much fruit. You want us to be people of power. You want us to be people of power. And people of love. And people of love. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. For what you're starting to do here tonight. For what you are starting to do here tonight. And what you're going to complete. And what you are going to complete. In your time. In your time. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I told you a little while ago how upset I get when I see Christians who are in pain. I also told you how upset I get when I see Christians who are struggling. But in truth, I get upset whenever I see any Christian is not living life in abundance. And I want to tell you why. And I want to tell you what our faith is all about. So that you really understand that Jesus did amazing things for us. That don't need to wait till we reach heaven. They start right now. Okay? <clears throat> now I need to teach you a little bit of theology. And I promise you it's not going to be boring. Okay? Imagine this ground is divided in two actually it is okay and this side of the ground is the world and this side of the ground is heaven what is this side of the ground world. and what is this side of the ground aren't you glad you're sitting on this side okay <laughs> now when god created us he created all of us to be here in heaven with him okay all of us were given dominion over creation all of us were pretty much like little gods. And God said, you can do whatever you want. You can eat of anything, drink of anything, but there's one little thing I don't want you to do. And I have this tree which contains the knowledge of good and evil, and I don't want you to eat of its fruit. Don't do that. Everything else is yours. But then as we all know, what happened? The devil came from the world, and he said, don't listen to him. He's a liar. The only reason he doesn't want you to eat of that fruit is because if you eat that fruit, you'll become like God. And very foolishly, we disobeyed God. We sinned. Say sinned. And in one stroke, we sold ourselves into slavery to the devil and became slaves of sin. We moved from heaven to the world. Now don't confuse the world with planet Earth and don't confuse heaven with some place in the sky. 
There are two spiritual states of being. Heaven is the state of being with God. The world is the state of being separated from God by death. Everyone with me still? Okay. Now the wages of sin is God made provision for someone to pay the price or something to pay the price. So every year, in the old days, a person would have to take an animal to the priest, a goat or a lamb or a bull or a calf. And in front of the priest, they would put their hand on the animal, identifying with the animal and in some metaphysical way, transferring their sins onto the animal. Everybody still with me? Then the animal was killed, his death instead of our death. Temporary atonement. 2,000 years ago, God said, enough, enough. So he told his son, Jesus, go down there. You be my lamb. You sacrifice yourself for their sins and bring them home to me. So Jesus came from heaven into the world. And now listen to this. When you are baptized in Christ, when you believe in Christ, you do the equivalent of putting your hand on Jesus, just like they used to put the hand on the animal. We identify with Jesus. We transfer our sins onto Jesus. When Jesus is crucified, we are crucified with Him. Our sins nailed to the cross with Him. When He dies, we die with Him in the world. And when He comes to life again, we come to new life here in heaven. Now listen to me very carefully. I want you to work miracles. In the world, if I take that bottle, where's my bottle? Get ready to catch. And I drop it, where is it going to fall? <laughs> Down, right? In heaven, I can drop this bottle and it can go anywhere because those rules don't apply here in heaven. Over there is the natural, here is the supernatural. Over there is the ordinary, over here is the extraordinary. Over there, miracles don't take place. Over here, only miracles take place. And for the Christian who lives here, please listen. For the Christian who lives in heaven, Miracles take place every single day of their lives. So now the question is simple. If miracles should take place every day in our lives, why are they not taking place in our lives? And you know the answer already. Even though we should be living here, we are still living there. Do you lie? He, 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 yes I lie. In the world, that's fine. In heaven, oh no. In the world, it is okay to cheat and to steal and to rob and to commit adultery and to do just about everything evil. In heaven, that is not possible. Now, I want to ask you a question. Brothers, sisters, don't take offense at anything I say, okay? But if I were to pick an equal number of people from the streets there, if I were to bring them here, put them across from you and say, compare yourselves to them, you know what? No difference. They worry, you worry. They get angry, you get angry. They are proud, you are proud. They struggle with sin, you struggle with sin. What is the difference between them and us? Nothing except that we say we believe in Christ. Now, all that is going to change because over the next two days and over the course of Lent and over the course of the rest of your life, you are going to start to live in heaven, acting like a child of God and understanding all the things that Jesus came and died for so that you might have. And you think it is only salvation? It is everything on this earth. And I'm going to tell you what. And this, the next 10 minutes, are honestly what is what the price of admission here today but before that I need you to do one thing for me one more time do you know what that is yes stand up hands up in the air Hallelujah. 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 H
Lord. Please be seated. Five sets of things that Jesus has done for us. You want healing? You're going to get it. And I'm going to tell you how it's going to happen. You want deliverance? You're going to get it. You want blessings? You're going to get it. You want freedom? You're going to get it. You want anointing? You're going to get it. Why? Because it's already been given. Now I'm going to teach you five sets. And I'm going to explain these five sets over the course of the next two days. I'm going to do a little part of it today because we're very quickly running out of time. Set number one. Okay? I'm redeemed. Say, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. I am saved. I'm restored. I'm restored. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. You know, forgiveness is the greatest thing that can happen to a Christian. Imagine this, all right? My brother here owes me a million rupees. Okay, that's a lot of money, right? Now, he's very worried. He's very anxious because he doesn't know when I'm going to come knocking on his door. What's your name? Linton. Clinton. And Clinton, where's my money? You don't have my money. I bring the policeman with me the next time I come to Clinton's house and Clinton is in the locker. He, there's no way he can pay me that money because he doesn't have it. But now imagine this. I come to Clinton and Clinton is there and he's coming and saying, I'm sorry my brother, I cannot pay you the money. Give me a little more time and I will pay you whatever I owe you. And I say, Clinton, don't worry about it. I wipe your debt clean. Clinton, what are you going to do? Show that you're happy. No, get up and jump up and down a little bit. No, it's all right. Sit down. <laughs> He's happy. And yet you look at the average Christian and they are the most unhappy people on this earth. I travel around the world preaching to Christians. And you know what I see when I walk into a church? I see a bunch of zombies. Have you seen zombies? They kind of sit at you and, and you wonder what is wrong. You know, so you say to them, God loves you. No, 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 you don't understand. God loves you. He loves you so much. Thank God you're not zombies. At least I see smiles in your faces. Praise the Lord for that. Do you know God loves you? How much does He love you? That's all? God loves you so much. Now tell me how much He loves you. <laughs> Way to go, Elizabeth. Strong <laughs> lungs there. <laughs> this is joy. I made you smile. Jesus wants you to smile, not once or twice. I preach Lenten retreats. And most of the time I see people come and acting, Lent is a period of mourning. It is not a period of mourning. It's a period of rejoicing because at the end of Lent, we celebrate the resurrection. Amen. Lent is that to make us think about the things of God. And what He wants you to think about here today is what He has done for you. He has redeemed you. He has restored you. The devil stole everything, right? You had everything in heaven, right? You had peace in heaven. You had joy in heaven. You had happiness in heaven. You had blessings in heaven. He took it and he stole all of it away. He took us into the muck. He took us into pain. He took us into hatred. He took us into grief. He took us into sorrow. He took us into worry. All these things, Jesus said, I have given you back. I have restored you. Isn't that cause for rejoicing? To be redeemed. To be restored. To be forgiven for debts that are so huge, none of us could pay it. What a source of joy. That is the reason I am joyful. 25 years ago, I went for confession. Without even my really saying sorry, God said, I forgive you. 25 years of sins. In one word, forgiven. Can you imagine that? And that is what I want us to understand then maybe you weren't sinners like I was, but you also are sinners in your own way. And every single sin that you commit is a debt that you've accumulated against our Father. Multiply that, the number of days there are in a year. Multiply that by the number of years you've been alive and see the debt you've accumulated against our Father. Yet you go to Him and even as you're about to open your mouth and say, sorry, He says, I've forgiven you. 
What joy? What joy? That is what God has given us, but that's only one thing that God has given us. But let us keep that in mind before we continue to the next. Say, I am redeemed. I'm redeemed. I am saved. I am restored. I am forgiven. Second set. I am cleansed. I am washed. I am pure. I am holy. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you are sinners over here? Raise your hands. Shame on you. Shame on you. What did you just say? You just said you are holy. You just said you are pure. You just said you are cleansed and washed in the blood of Jesus. How dare you say the opposite? I want you to think about these things today because for too long have we confessed the wrong things. Yes, I know the church says that we are sinners. And you need to understand why the church does that. I'm going to come to that later. But I need you to understand what Jesus has done for you. And what he has done. He has sanctified you. Has he not? He has justified you. Has he not? He has cleansed you in his blood. Has he not? He has washed you with his blood. Has he not? What does that mean? It means you are just like him now in heaven no longer a sinner that you were in the world, but now a saint in heaven. Say, I am a saint. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're a saint. Go on, tell the person next to you. Ask the person, do you believe me? And the person says, no, and that's all right. That is all right. You will believe before this retreat is over. And I will tell you why I say the things that I say. Because truly by his death and resurrection, if you understood anything that I spoke about in the last half an hour, it's what Jesus has done for you. Now you might look at your life. Nikita over here might say, but I know I'm still lying. She might say, I know I'm still gossiping. How can I say I'm not a sinner? Listen to this carefully. Don't declare what you are doing. Declare what Jesus has done. And that is the power of our faith. And that is how we're going to be able to do the things of God. If we understand that it is not we who are doing all these things, but He who has done it and continues to do it through His grace. The problem for the Christian and in the Christian journey is for the longest time has become about us and our effort. Listen to what Paul said to the Galatians. You have been saved by the Spirit of God. And having been saved by the Spirit, you're not putting your own effort. Jesus says, I will complete the work that I have begun in you. And this is what I want us to understand during the season of Lent. Stop making the effort. The only effort you need to make is to say, Jesus, I believe in you. And I believe what you have done for me. Help me to live life on heaven. And leave the effort to him. He will finish what he has started, not you. His spirit will finish what he has started, not you. His grace will finish what he has started, not you. And the moment you're like that, what happens? You relax. Swapna began the session today by saying, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I look at you, my brothers and sisters, what do I see? I see tired people. I see people who are exhausted trying to be holy. I see people who are depressed because they think they cannot be holy. I see people who have been struggling and failing and struggling and failing and thinking they're not worthy to be with God anymore. Understand. God says you're worthy because He has made you worthy. His robe of salvation covers you. And when you understand what Jesus says, I really need you to understand the words that He says and what they mean. Come to me. Say, come to me. All you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am meek and gentle in heart, and there will be rest for your soul. I need to borrow somebody.
Can I borrow you, my brother? Come. Don't worry, I'm not going to stone you. You have a problem with that? You can't walk? Come. You have to come. Don't tell me you cannot walk. Don't tell me you cannot walk. Put your hands together for him. You're walking, aren't you? Why did you say you can't walk? Don't say that. You walked just now. Say, praise the Lord. I walked. Now imagine I'm Jesus, all right? And he's just an ordinary man who thought he couldn't walk till two minutes ago. Now Jesus says, come to me. He's very tired. He's met with an accident. His foot is injured. Jesus says, what are you doing sitting over there? Come to me and I will give you rest. Now this is what Jesus says. Take my yoke upon you. Have you seen two cows? They're yoked to each other. Have you seen cows? All of you are from India. You've seen a farm and you've seen two cows plowing the field. This is what it means to be yoked. I put my yoke around him. Put your yoke around me, my brother. Put your arm around my shoulder. Now we are yoked. Now what happens? My brother's burdens that have been too heavy for him to carry become mine. And I'm stronger than he is, don't you think? And I've got broader shoulders than you two, don't you think? Yeah. So his weight is going to be next to nothing. Now look at this. We're journeying through life. And how do we journey through life? We journey alone. But my brother here is journeying with me. So if I walk, where can he go? He has to walk with me, no? Try to go somewhere. Go? Yes. He's not going, he's staying with me. Which means that if I decide to suddenly go round and round, he has to go round and round with me. Wave to the camera. <laughs> that is what it means. We've made our journey very difficult. And it has been very difficult. But it doesn't need to be difficult at all. Because Jesus will do what you want to do. Let him do what he needs to do. Shall we go back? Yeah. Can you walk? Yes. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Go on. Thank you. You're welcome. You need to testify before this meeting is over. I was in Sri Lanka last year for the first <coughs> of our missions. And there were a lot of people like my brother there. The people who came in wheelchairs, there were people who came on crutches. There was this young girl, she must have been about 19 years old. She came in a wheelchair and she was taken from the wheelchair and put into the chair. And I went to her and I asked her, what happened to you? And she said, the doctors have said the half. The nerves in my body are dead. So I said, Jesus is saying to you that all the nerves in your body are well. Get up and walk. And you know what she did? She got up and walked. Which brings me to my third set of things. I'm not doing the healing. Jesus is doing the healing. What has he done? Say, I am healed. I am healed. In heart. In heart. In spirit. In spirit. In mind. In mind. In soul. In soul. In body. In body. Many times we go to God and say, God, I'm in pain. Heal me. Heal me. Heal me. You know what he says? Don't you know I've already healed you? His word says, by his stripes we're healed. Have you heard that before? Yes, yes. And yet, when I went to my brother and I said, come, you know the first thing he said to me? He said, I can't walk. And that is what we do. We go to the doctor and he gives you a long disease that you can't even pronounce. And you know what you do? You go around telling everybody, you know what I have? I have a little more than And then you go to the next person and you say, the doctor has given me nine months to live. You know why? Because I have a little more even when you have a small backache, you act like as if it's the end of the world. My God, I can't walk. Jesus has healed you. Not He's going to heal you. He has healed you. And once again, you might say, but look at my medical report. This is what it says. Once again, I am telling you, don't declare what you see. Declare what He has done. Amen. And that is what makes all the difference. Say, I am healed. I am, healed. I, am blessed. I am blessed. Which comes to blessings. Do you know how blessed you are? Everything that is God's has been given to you. You struggle with jobs. You struggle without money. 
You struggle with relationships. And all the time you're going to God and you're going for retreats like this and saying, God, give me, God, give me, God, give me, God, give me. You know what I think God says in his mind? When are these people going to learn? I've already given them all the blessings. It is like he's given us a huge storehouse of wealth. Right? We got that wealth with us. He's given it to us when we're baptized. And yet we will forget about that and go to God like a beggar and say, Lord, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. Give me, give me, give me. When he gives you, give me more, give me more, give me more. And he says, I've already given you. Take a look. And that's what I want you guys to take back with you when you leave here tonight. That every single blessing you're going to ask God for, he has already given you. All he's going to do is give you more and more in the days to come as you come to discover the faith that we have, the power of the faith that we have, and the power of the God that we believe in, which com comes, brings me to number five. I am a child of God. I Say, am a child of God. I am a friend to Jesus. I am a friend to Jesus. And I am a temple to the Holy Spirit. And I am a temple to the Holy Spirit. You know the first song we sang? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We sing these songs. He's our friend. But we don't believe that. You'd rather have me for your friend. And I'll tell you what many of you are going to do in the next two days. You're going to come to me and say, Brother, will you please put your hand on my head and pray for me? Who am I going to pray to? I'm going to pray to my friend, no? <laughs> or I'm going to heal you. Is that what you think? All I can do is pray to my friend. And if I can pray to my friend, why can't you make him your friend and kind of say, Jesus, you know your Anil's friend, you do so many funky things for him, why don't you do these things for me too? <laughs> and what do you think he's going to do? Tell me, what do you think he's going to do? What do you think he's already done? Because that's what he's going to say to you. You're coming to me asking for things I've already given you? Take it now. Today we're going to begin with a bloodbath. We're going to have Jesus come and um, uh, we, yeah, we'll have him right here in our midst. And then I'll lead you through a prayer of cleansing. And during this prayer of cleansing, I'm not going to give you a long lecture on sins. All of you know what a sin is, right? All of you know the things you shouldn't do, right? So I'm not going to give you a long sermon on that. You've got sermons for all your life on that. Today all I want you to do is basically just look at Jesus on the cross and say, really sorry that you had to go through all of that. What I want to do now is to just come and say, thank you for what you did and let you wash me in your blood. And as Jesus washes us, truly believe that he is really making you sanctified. He's really making you into a saint. And that is how I want us to leave here tonight. Now, I might not get the chance to say this afterwards, but please make a confession this land. There are many of you who have not gone for confession in the longest time. You say, why do I need to go to a priest for confession? Doesn't God forgive us? Yes, it is only God who forgives us. But God has given priests the ability, the power to, to give us the forgiveness that we seek. Soon after his resurrection, he appeared to his apostles. <clears throat> and he said to them, peace be with you. Then he breathed the spirit over them. And once again, he said, peace be with you. And he said, as you forgive men their sins, their sins will be forgiven. That's one reason why we need to go to a priest. Another reason is when we sin, we hurt people around us, don't we? Now you can't go to everyone and say sorry, can you? So the priest stands in the center of that. You go to the priest and say, I'm sorry for everything. And the third reason is simply to kind of Feel free. How many of you deposit money in an ATM machine? You'll do that sometimes? Now when you deposit the money, you know the money has gone in, but you wait for the receipt, don't you? Because that receipt tells you your money is safely with the bank. And when the priest says, I absolve you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, know that you truly are absolved. Now when you leave the confessional, please leave with a smile on your face. Very often I see people enter the confession sad, they come out sadder. I don't know why. 
when you leave the confessional, understand everything has been forgiven. Now we're going to invite Jesus here. So just prepare your heart for him. Jesus, I adore you. And I lay my life before you. How I love you. Father, I adore you. Down in adoration for holy Lord, the sacred host we hear. Lower Asian forms departing, newer rites of grace prevail. Faith for all defects supply. Where the feeble senses fade To the everlasting Father And the Son who reigns on high With the Holy Ghost proceeding Forth from His eternally be salvation, honor, blessing, might and endless majesty. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who in this wonderful sacrament has left us a memorial of thy passion. Grant us, we beseech thee, so to venerate the sacred mysteries of the body and blood, that we may experience within us the fruit of their redemption, who live and reign forever and ever. Oh. 
I'm restored and I'm forgiven. And I'm forgiven. That's because. That's because. I believe. I believe. In my Lord. In my Lord. That He came. That He came. And He died. And He died for my sins. For my sins and my failures. Because He loves me. Because He loves me. Blessed Lamb of God. The blessed Lamb of God. I am washed. I am washed. I am cleansed. I am cleansed. I am pure. I am pure. And I'm holy. And I'm holy. That's because, That's because I believe. I believe in my, in my Lord. That He came. That He came. And He died. And he died for my sins and, for my, sins and my failures. Because He loves me. Because He loves me. Blessed Lamb of God. The blessed Lamb of God. I am blessed. I am blessed. In spirit, heart, mind, and body, that's because I believe in my Lord that He came and He died for my sins and my failures, cause He loves me. The blessed land. I am strong. I am totally victorious. I am totally victorious. That's because, That's because I believe, I believe in, my Lord. in my Lord. That He came and He died for my sins and my failures. Cause He loves me. Blessed Lamb of God. I'm a friend of my God. I'm a friend of my God. And I'm a friend of Jesus. And I'm a friend of Jesus. That's because, That's because I believe. I believe in his love. In his love. That he came and he died. Say